wonderful? Didn't I say he would come? You dare escort that oaf in here and, and allow him to climb on the hallowed throne? And why not? He is the wizard. The wizard, or so he says. Did it not occur to you that he might be an imposter? In league with a wicked witch and sent here to kill us. Wicked witch, don't be ridiculous. Oh, I'm not the one who's underestimating her cleverness. Or maybe it's you I'm underestimating. Have you finally joined her side, sister? I am on no one's side. You know that. I, I simply want peace. It's all I ever wanted, and the wizard can do that. He's a good man. Oh, what do you know about goodness? Deep down, you are wicked. I'm not wicked! <laughs> Really is wasted on you. And that was a clip from Oz, the great and powerful. I'm delighted to say we've been joined by its director, the one and only Sam Raimi. Sam, good afternoon. Thanks for having me on the show. Uh, it's very nice of you to come back on the show. And Mark is here uh, as well. Can you just uh, say what your thoughts were right at the very beginning about how on earth you begin to approach making a prequel to one of the most loved and iconic American films ever made? Well, I was terrified. I thought... The downside was tremendous that everyone who loves the Wizard of Oz movie may look down upon a prequel being made, something that something else that was based on L. Frank Baum's works. But then I read the script and I was moved emotionally by the story of this selfish man who somewhere deep within him has a good heart and his journey to Oz and how he's gotten a second chance there and how through the love of this little China girl and the friendship of a little winged monkey, and through wanting to become worthy of the love of Glinda the Good Witch, he becomes a better person. He be his heart grows a little bit, and he becomes a little more of a selfless person. And I thought that is a very moving story. And if I could take that feeling that I got reading the screenplay and put it into the movie and give it to the audience, they would forgive me. And Sam, one of the things you had to deal with was uh, whether or not you were allowed to replicate any material in the original movie. There's all this issue about Warner saying you can't, you know, you can't even, the witch can't even be the same green colour. How did you work around that? It's true. MGM, the rights to the MGM movie is now owned by Warner Brothers. So anything that was unique to the MGM movie that was not in the L. Frank Baum's original works were forbidden for us to use. We just didn't have the rights to it. At first, I was heartbroken because I didn't want to reimagine the Emerald City or the Yellow Brick Road or any of these iconic images that are in our filmic DNA. Yeah. But then and I realized I had the only, the only way I could move forward was without it, and it was kind of a freeing thing. Robert Stromberg, a production designer, and myself were free to reinvent the world of Oz. So we went back to the original illustrator in Baum's work, Denslow was his name, drew a lot of inspiration from there, and Robert also went back to the 1930s Walt Disney animated frames. And in the backgrounds, we saw a whimsical world that was a great influence on Robert. And those were the main sources of influence, I think, for Robert to start out creating the world of Oz. Now, Sam, you started out in, in horror. The very first time I interviewed you was, uh, for, I think, for Fangoria magazine. You were making Dark Man, and we talked about the Evil Dead, which at that point was actually banned on video in the UK. One of the interesting things about Wizard of Oz is that although it's a family film, it has terrifying elements in it with the flying monkeys. Now, with Oz the Great and Powerful, how did you balance how scary it could be with how family-friendly it had to be? Well, that was exactly what our goal was, to find that balance. I wanted to make the ultimate Disney picture, something that old Walt Disney would have been proud of, or at least would have approved of if he had seen it today. So... I thought back to The Wizard of Oz and the Disney pictures, and they always seem to have a scary, spooky element to them. I think kids really dig that. They like that. And even though the parents think that it's not good for them, a little bit is great. And I remember as a kid just loving a little bit of spooky time in the pictures. And you think about it, Wizard of Oz has real scary moments. The wicked witch throws that fireball and burns the scarecrow alive. Dorothy with that uh, pail of acid that she splashes in the witch's face. They're all pretty intense. So this movie, we never went that far. We stayed, we had some spooky scenes because we do have a Wicked Witch and her army of winged baboons and we wanted to give the, the kids a thrill. But we tried to find a balance, as you suggest, where the parents felt they could still bring their kids to the movie and have a good time. You should know, Sam, that Mark is a, one of the things he bangs on about an awful lot is how 3D is not the future. <laughs> uh, you're working in 3D for the first time. What did, uh, what did you make of that? And what would you say to skeptics like Mark here? I think he's right. 
<laughs> you didn't expect that, did you, Simon? No, I <laughs> See, Simon, you learned something from Mark now. Yeah. Now, he, when I started the picture, I thought, 3D usually doesn't work for me. It gives me a headache. It strains my eyes. But I thought it actually is the right tool for this particular project because half of Baum's writing is about this fantastic land. And now with the incredible tools we have with the computer and CGI artistry, I thought that the added use of dimensionality would really allow the audience to experience the world of Baum like never before. So in this case, I thought it was the right tool. It's kind of like a zoom lens. It can be abused or used properly and subtly and really be a valuable tool in the filmmaking arsenal. But well, I, I, hang on, hang on, before we go there, so, so, it, so it was the right decision for this film, just not in general. Is that, is that the essence of what you're saying? Um, not in general for me, because it puts a strain on my eyes if it's not used right. That was really why I reacted badly to it. So I had to learn, I, had to, I didn't know anything about 3D. I had to go to 3D school, learn how it was put together, how not to strain the eyes, how to make it a pleasant experience. And it has a lot to do with lighting and not going from one convergence, convergence setting to another extreme convergence setting in a cut-to-cut -cut way that's too extreme for the audience. They have to be planned like a piece of music, like a gentle waterfall, one convergence setting to the next. Plus, the cutting pattern has to be a lot slower because it takes a moment for the eyes to adjust to any new convergence. So there's a lot of secrets about making it a pleasant experience for the audience that very rarely are followed. It actually is a very good technology, but not applied usually very well. What about the fact that, like the original Wizard of Oz, you start out in black and white, four by three, and then we move into this color world? It's almost like at the beginning of the film, you're taking us back to the beginning of cinema. It was a tribute to the great Victor Fleming, the director of the original 39 Wizard of Oz. And of course, we all know the moment when Dorothy steps out of the house into that fantastic Technicolor world. So in tribute to that, when our wizard comes into the world of Oz, we go from black and white to color, but also we updated it a little bit and we go from a mono sound setting that we had for the first 13 minutes of the film, and we go to stereo, and we go to full surround as the choir comes up on the track, we dial up the dimensionality, and the film frame goes from a 133 aspect ratio to full widescreen. So hopefully the audience will feel like they really can see and feel and hear as they enter the land of Oz for the very first time. Sam, when you first started out, you raised the money for your first film from borrowing from dentists and local stores, famously. You're now working with, you know, $100 million budgets. Do you still have the same set of skills that you had when you started out? I think I have the same set of skills and different interests. When I started out, I was interested in the basics of filmmaking. What does one image cut against another imply to the audience? These are the basic questions I'm I was asking. How to build a suspense sequence? What are the audience's expectations? When do I deliver the scare? When do I lay back? Now, those are mostly technical considerations. And I, I loved it. But as I've grown and lived a life and become married and had losses and, and children and experiences, I become more interested in the character, the human story, the human heart. So now I'm interested in telling the story, in this case, of a selfish man whose heart opens up. And the technical is still of interest to me, and it supports the story, but it's not the, not the be-all and the end-all. It's not the, the, the end. Uh, we have some questions from listeners, uh, Sam. Steve uh, Horvath via our, uh, from our Facebook page. Are there parallels, Sam, in the narrative between the Oz character that James Franco plays within the film and your own Hollywood experience? Basically, what I'm saying, says Steve, is Hollywood run by flying death monkeys? <laughs> No, it's not. And as far as the experiences of Oz relative to me, I don't think I see any parallels with my career. But, you know, I really relate to the character on a personal level. And I see myself as Oz before, the character of Oz before he gets to the magical land of Oz, before he changes. I see my own selfishness. I wish that I could realize that love is all that I needed to make me happy. I've got it right in front of me, just like him. I'm kind of like the undeveloped, character and I wish that I had the same epiphany and and movement forward emotionally that Oz experiences in the climax of the picture. I'm kind of stuck in the first act in my own life though. So I'm looking forward. We have a couple of remakes coming up. There's an Evil Dead remake, which obviously I'm worried about because I love the original Evil Dead and, and Poltergeist. Tell us about what what you can about those two. Well Poltergeist is a picture that is a great Toby Hooper, Steven Spielberg classic. And David Lindsay and Bear, the writer of Oz, has fashioned a script and we are starting to look for a director on that picture. I'm just a producer on it. 
as far as Evil Dead, the new remake is shot and it's coming out in a month and it kicks buttocks. It's, <laughs> it's really good. I've seen it with an audience and they are screaming and going crazy at the, at the show. Okay. Is it scary? Is it as scary as the first time? Yes. Okay. How, oh, can you give us any more detail? Yes, it's directed by Fede Alvarez, a great and new first-timer from Uruguay. He wrote it with his friend Rolo, and it's still five kids going to a cabin. There's no Ash character, played by Bruce Campbell in the original. And it really is a gut-wrenching, non-stop, thrill-a-second horror ride. So if you don't want to be terra-freaking-fied, then don't <laughs> don't go to this picture. Is that is that a proper word, Sam? Terra-freaking-fied? Terra I'm I, not... I think it was developed for your show, sir. I'm not sure it's in the Queen's English. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> yeah, she said it in the Queen's speech. Uh, did she, she say that? Yeah, she said she's had a terror freak year. Yeah, is that, that was, right? Yeah, that okay. was right. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll pass that on. <laughs> Sam, we really appreciate, appreciate your time with us. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me on your show, fellas. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Sam. Bye.